welcome back to another podcast. Uh, we are here in uh, Romania in the studio with uh, a lovely family that uh, we get the chance to know. And um, they are in ministry for a lot of years and they will share with us uh, wisdom and useful things from their experience uh, with God. So welcome uh, Marjorie and Gerald Cole. Um, we are glad to to have you both in our studio. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, uh, we have uh, been married for almost 54 years. Yeah. And we love the Lord Jesus. Uh, we've known the Lord for about 50 years, and we've been involved in pastoral ministry. We have um, four daughters and uh, 11 grandchildren. So we've, we've been involved with a lot of uh, pastoral ministry, mm -hmm. evangelism ministry, uh, international evangelism, and so forth. And uh, so God has been very faithful to us. And we've gotten, by God's grace, through a lot of difficult times mm -hmm. and, and a lot of glorious times. Yeah, and so amen. we're very thankful to have the opportunity to be with you folks today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And we have a lot of adventures that we could share with you in terms of walking with Jesus, walking, in, walking out your Christian life. Um, and how the Lord works. And of course, he works other in other people differently. But I think some of the general experiences we have are, are you know, very common to people, um, especially in the area of being pastors um, and pastoring people and teaching the word of God and finding the resistance and finding the things that we discovered along the way that weren't right mm -hmm. and uh, had to make some adjustments and corrections in our own lives. So, yes, we're excited to be here. Thank you. So we want to discuss uh, about the role of men. It's very important uh, today for men to know what's their role, because uh, if you look uh, outside in, in the world, uh, it's all mixed up. Uh, they try to to make uh, the, the, the men to be like a woman and the women to be like a man. What's the role of the man for for his family? Let's talk about that first. Well, the first uh, role of a uh, man for a family is to be a husband. You know, in Ephesians, uh, it talks about husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And so uh, a leader and a lover in uh, Ephesians. You summarize it, a man is called to be the leader of his wife. That's not a dictator, mm -hmm. not a dictator, uh, a leader and a lover, and, a, and, a, and, and to serve and, and nurture the wife. And the wife is to be the respecter of his leadership and the responder to his love. And so that's really the foundation. Uh, and, and we're in a place now, as you mentioned, the foundations of even sexual identity are, are being shaken and where men don't know if they're men or not and they don't know if they're women don't know if they're men or women and it's it's a lot of confusion but god did make uh, uh mankind male and female male and female and he called um he said he took a look at adam he said it's not good for him to be alone i will make a help for comparable to him a uh, meet for him it says in the old king james so someone to be alongside him to be with him that together uh, i think it's peter that talks about that they would be heirs of life together and, and the oneness and so that's that's really the foundation of a man's role as a as a husband and then you get into the uh, fatherhood it says um Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he should not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. And then uh, fathers uh, in Ephesians 6, I think it's 1 through 4, don't discourage your children, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So sometimes what's happened is men have 
relegated the raising and training of children to the wife. And yes, the mother has a definite role in training and nurturing the children, but the husband is to take the leadership in that role, mm -hmm. not as a dictator, not as an iron fisted, well, you're going to do it my way or else, and I'm the leader here and I'm the head and you got to mm -hmm. submit to me no matter what I do. That's not the spirit of Christ. So it's, it's, a, it's a working together with husband and wife in, in that role of, of nurturing a family. Mm -hmm. I think too, in the Proverbs, it says that the glory of the child is their father. And so the opposite of glory is shame. And so when children don't have a father in the home to look up to, maybe they're abandoned, there's an, a divorce, uh, or their father is not uh, their hero. I mean, I believe he needs to be their hero, at least uh, in some element. I mean, whether he's a righteous man, they can look to him and, and see he's a righteous man or he's he's an accomplished man. They have to somehow see him as their protector, their hero, so that um, they're not alone and afraid. And, and because children are vulnerable as well, and so they need that protection. A lot of men um, don't see themselves as valuable in their in their fault in their roles. I, I really believe they they've abdicated um, to the wife. I think that um, because of the amount of anxiety and pressure, the man is thinking, "All I have to do is make the money." And she'll do the rest. And uh, you're, you're right. And the other thing is the flip of that is when men are not really satisfied or satisfying the role as a leader, as, as the protector, as you said, the leader and protector, they then become upset um, with themselves and they're vulnerable to the attack of the enemy who's always there to say you should have, could have done it better, done it different. You didn't do it right. You're not, you're not making enough money, whatever it is whatever's not perfect in their situation, they take the, the responsibility for it and they become vulnerable to being attacked by the enemy for not having provided enough money or, you know, building a better house for their wife. And so the men, as they become discouraged and the wife, then she doesn't really know sometimes how to build him up. And you go back to what you said about the helper, the wife is to be the helper. I think that means to also to be the encourager Mm -hmm. Men need to be encouraged. Everybody, everybody seems to look at the, the thing that's wrong. Well, we need mm -hmm. more of this, the spot on the shirt, not the whole shirt. Well, it's the spot. It's the this. It's not there yet. We, we're not doing it right. You've got to do more of this. And so this becomes very difficult for a man because men are set up on kind of a different frequency, I think, than women. They have more of a, uh, an ego that needs to be um and respected. I think they need the respect. Women need the love and the, and the the assurance, but men need the respect. And so when women are feeling um, anxious or not provided for, they're not respecting the man. And he get, it's just kind of a domino effect. Mm -hmm. But as far as the involvement of men in the church, we mentioned that in, at the beginning of our time here. Um, in the church, uh, many, we've seen that a lot um, where the guy he's he's just out there and doing his deal and working and whatever and the women are there they're the prayer warriors they're they're doing all this uh, in the church and that's really hurt the church God bless the faithful women I mean thank God for faithful women that are are praying and nurturing and loving Jesus and praying for their husbands to get saved come to, to come to know the Lord and yeah spend years praying for yeah, him to come to know the Lord. And, and when the husband should be there, you know, taking the leadership in the home, you know, spiritually and, and every other way um, in the church too, there's a role that men are to have. And, and that is, I would call it a servant leader, being a servant leader. Jesus said he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Um, every, everyone has a uniqueness about them, unique giftings and callings and so forth. Mm -hmm. And and there's a, a place, sometimes people say, well, if I'm not a pastor or an evangelist or a missionary, what good am I in the church? Or if I can't just, you know, fix the roof or something. But there's a whole variety of ministries that men have of, of, of serving the Lord. And, but the character is, is so important um, that having a godly character, it, it, you know, your character is more important than your charisma. 
you know, charisma is how other people see you, what you look like on the outside, but what's your godly character? Uh, I, I think of in Acts chapter six, there's the, um, when they were choosing the deacons to serve the widows that were being neglected in the early church in Jerusalem, they said, you know, get, get men, get seven men uh, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom that we may appoint over this business. Mm -hmm. So a uh, good reputation, mm -hmm. full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is so important, the, the character. Uh, and, and it's interesting too, where Paul told Timothy, he says, uh, and uh, train faithful men, mm -hmm. find faithful men and teach them. So the, the faithfulness, that means loyalty, dedication, mm -hmm to to the lord mm -hmm. and and to the to the people uh faithfulness faithfulness is one of the greatest attributes mm -hmm. that we can have you know he said who tra commit the the things that you've heard of me among many witnesses commit to faithful men mm -hmm. who shall be able to teach others also mm -hmm. so faithfulness sometimes we think well let's look for people that are gifted in this area well, if, if someone's really gifted, but they're not faithful, mm -hmm. really, what, what good is that? Mm -hmm. So uh, find faithful, loyal, God, uh, men of godly character, and then the giftings will be released to, to bless the church and, and to bless their families. Well, I think, too, when you're talking about faithfulness, I really see that as integrity, um, yes. integrity, purity. Uh, one who is co consistent all the way through. They don't have hidden agendas. They don't have secrets. They don't have other motives. They're not trying to build the church or, or something so they can look good. It's not an empire building kind of thing, but they're men who are integ they have integrity in the things of God. And, and, and the things of God are the most important to them. Um, and if, they, if you find a man like that, uh, they're more, I think they're more precious than gold and they're probably more rare than gold too, because um, there's just, there's just such a much of confusion, you know. The enemy is always working to undermine our sense of identity, who we are. We don't know who we are. Many in the church really don't know who they are because they don't really have a concept of where they come from. They know we're created by God, but then that stops right there. It doesn't. So now we switch over to everybody has to be defined by their behavior instead of by their being and by their origin. And men are the same way. I mean, men are really, m m women are vain in, in some ways. And, and you know, they want to look beautiful and they have all their other catty things that they do. But men are really, they're really hooked in to trying to be important mm -hmm. by what they do. They want to, mm -hmm. they want to be seen as successful. They want their church has to be big. They have to have, you know, whatever it is, you know, they have to have their name on something. They have to be successful. And this takes away from being men of integrity because a lot of times they'll compromise their, 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 the, the faithfulness and the, and the truth and the purity of who they are. They'll compromise it with, you know, to get an advantage or to sell out on something or to, you know, compromise, do something that's not, not, uh, not worthy mm. of, of the Lord. And, and so they become compromised. And so you, have a lot of this mixture in men and then they're vulnerable because once the devil gets you compromised on something, that's where he comes in again and again to take more from you, take more advantage of you, uh, blackmail you, bully you, betray you. And that's why men in not just in church, but in the society in general are super compromised because they have been tricked, deceived, pulled away, enticed, by the things of the world to become great. They've been, here's another thing with men. They're, they're easily seduced with flattery and, and Satan mm -hmm. knows that. So that's why he practices a lot of witchcraft against men. So another thing too, with, with integrity, if you don't have integrity, what you, you're haunted by evil secrets, mm -hmm. right? So uh, integrity, it's like a piece of furniture. If it's solid wood, it's the same all the way through. If it's if it's cheap furniture, it has it has a cheaper wood underneath and then a coating, and so a lot of people are, they have this coating veneer, this veneer, yeah. and it, and they look so good and look so wonderful, but then 
what's what we find out is that oh man they were they were living this double life mm -hmm. the integrity is just absolutely essential well then you don't have to be ashamed of being exposed yeah because you've got you've got nothing to hide you're right not fake right you're not right you're not you're not um, fake well, thank you for, for telling us all that. And I, I'm pretty sure this will be very encouraging for many uh, men and especially young men uh, who are trying to find their way. You know, it's a tough world, uh, even for Christians. I think that's one of the reasons we want to do this, to help them in their journey to understand their place, you know. One of the questions we, we have for today uh, and we like to ask you is, what type of man is God using in the Bible? Um, what kind of man we, we see there in the stories of the Bible? It's uh, just one type or we can see different type of personalities. Is personality important or something else is what God is looking for? Well, you know, God, <laughs> um, I think it's in um, the Lord looks throughout the earth to, uh, to show himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward him. Now, we see in the Bible such an amazing variety of men that God worked through. Mm -hmm. I mean, all personalities, all different backgrounds, mm -hmm. um, all different situations they found themselves in. It's just an amazing, amazing variety. Collection. Well, well, you know, it, and, and so God can wants to work through, uh, through men. Here's another thing. I believe that men, uh, and, and God believes this too, we're made for adventure. You know, you, you think of people that, you know, have uh, men that have adventure in the world, you know, sports or mountain climbing or skydiving or, you know, all kinds of going to war sports, going to war. It's it's all about adventure. And, you know, what happens is that many times in the church, we've made Jesus look boring that serving Christ is somehow it's just boring and sitting in a pew on Sunday morning and listening to a sermon and keeping mm -hmm. yourself awake. Mm -hmm. And, but there, it, this serving the Lord is an amazing adventure. There was a blind woman many years ago named Helen Keller that said, life is either an incredible adventure or it's nothing. Mm -hmm. And so Serving the Lord is a, is a great adventure. But if you think of even the apostles, the 12 apostles, um, and you've got Old Testament, before we get to that, Old Testament, you have uh, Moses, you have Gideon, you have Amos, you have Jeremiah, you have Isaiah, Jehu, <laughs> Jehu you have uh, all, all men and women that were just, that God worked through so powerfully. powerfully. They were imperfect people. Moses was a murderer. David was a murderer. Uh, Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, was a murderer. I mean, and, and so it, we're not excusing murder or sin or anything, but you know, God takes them. And uh, remakes uh, them. Yeah, and he takes them. There's an old saying that we've had here in America. A lot, a lot of people have forgotten it, but God takes you from the guttermost to the uttermost. From the, from the gutter to the highest places. And, and when you just look at the apostles, for example, so you had one, um, uh, you had um, James and John. They were hot-tempered. Jesus called them sons of thunder. They were very, very um, hot-tempered. They wanted to call fire down on people that wouldn't listen to them. Lord, just let's just kill them. And, mm -hmm. and then you had a revolutionary. You had Simon the Zealot whose philosophy was the only good Roman was a dead Roman. He was a revolutionary. And you had a tax collector. Uh, you know, they worked for the uh, tax system and so forth. And so you had all this going on. And uh, uh, also, who else did we have? Uh, Philip. Uh, and you had 
uh, Bartholomew and different ones. Uh, they were there was such a, a, a variety ordinary and fishermen, you know, uh, you know Peter, uh, and, and then uh, who was very self confident and kind of hot tempered and. And then you had Andrew, who was just more quiet, and his brother Andrew was more quiet and retiring. And about he, about all he did though was lead, bring people to Jesus. So I mean, that was about all he did. There's such a variety, uh, and you had uh, uh, Barnabas, who whose name was real name was Joseph, and he was uh, he. They gave him a nickname. We know him as Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was an encourager. And so there's such a variety, and God will take some of the weakest people. In First Corinthians chapter one, it talks about God chooses the the weak and the nothings and the the broken and and mm-hmm. and I mean, and you think of you know Mary Magdalene. If you you know we're getting crossing into the women here, but I mean she had seven demons that Jesus cast out. So there's there's a whole variety and there's a place for us, not just in the conventional uh, areas of, uh, you know, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and so forth. We believe those are very important roles, um, but there's so many areas that God has uniquely designed people for. It's like tools in a toolbox, Mm -hmm. a mechanic's toolbox. Mm -hmm. There's a tool for every kind of thing, every situation. You you don't use a hammer to loosen a a nut on a bolt. You use a certain kind of wrench. And so there's, there's, God has designed us Mm -hmm. and equipped us Mm -hmm. to, uh, for a variety of things. So, the whole deal is that we're, whatever role that a man is in, in serving the Lord, need to realize that, yes, God can work through me. God can work through me, mm-hmm. that, that I, I am valuable before God. I'm not, I'm not proud, I'm not arrogant, but I'm valuable Yielded. before God, yeah. and, and God mm-hmm. wants to work through me in a variety of ways. And it's such a joy when you see people coming to know Christ. The other there's battles and all kinds of things that get very intense. But when you see people coming to know Christ, growing in Christ, you see answers to prayer, you see miracles, you see signs and wonders, wonders, and says that's this is uh, this is an adventure, and that's what God has called us to as mm-hmm. as men mm-hmm. and women actually, but. Uh, in into this adventure of serving the Lord. Well, I think part of that adventure is you know they love to be heroes. They love to rescue. They love to save. They love to um, fix things, make things right, put things back in order. Uh, And that's exactly what all needs to be done in this world. Uh, But but the big understanding is that we are in a war, the spiritual war, and God uses, you know, everybody from the foundation of the world. He has provided, prepared, put the gifts in, identified, you know, he's prepared the vessels um, you, I, the man, different, different ones, different ways to do a specific thing for the time, for such a time as this, whether it was Esther or it was King David or whoever it was. So, but, but we cannot re- refuse God's call. God says, I, I created you, I perfected you, performed you. Yes, you're weak. Yes, you have flaws. That's okay. I'll be with you. I, you know, I'll take care of that. Just follow me. Just give me what you have. Give me the five loaves and the two fishes and don't worry about the us the rest of it because but many men say well i can't do that women I, like who, who am i you know um i can't i've got nothing to give nothing to say and so they just bow out they just excuse themselves and what it really is is the enemy tempting you to unbelief to not believe god not to step forward not to take the step of faith i remember when we were you know we've had to take several steps of faith in our life and one of the bigger steps of faith, I mean, it, you know, well, we can talk about this next, but, you know, steps of faith, stepping out into what you don't know. You feel you're supposed to go there, men take that leadership role, but you, you don't have all the pieces in place. You don't have all everything figured out. You're just acting, taking a step of faith to lead your family to another place or take a different job or 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 step up in the into the church and, and, and do something. And you know what? 
The problem is, um, it's not just all the jobs in the church. There's so many jobs outside of the church that belong to the body of mm -hmm. Christ mm -hmm. that need to be done. I was just thinking of the man who, um, uh, there's this new movie coming out called Sound of Freedom, Sounds of Freedom. And this, this it's a story of this man. I think he was a Navy SEAL. I'm not sure, but he took it upon himself. He's a godly man to begin to rescue the children that have been bought and sold in sex trafficking. And he and, and some of his team, they went out to do that. So they made a movie of his, of his life. But here I'm thinking is a man, I'm sure he doesn't do much in the church. You know, he probably isn't a deacon. He's probably not taking up the offering. He's probably not, you know, teaching Sunday school class, but he found a place in God where God called him. And it's not just in the building to go outside and minister to the body, the church, of Jesus Christ, the will of God, the kingdom of God, to do something different. And I think we have to look mm -hmm. to the kingdom of God to do something in the kingdom of God, not just in a church building that we think of as a church building, you know, because there's limited jobs there. Mm -hmm. And you can move the chairs around, or you can set up the mic, or you can, and that's all good stuff. But God may call you outside of that building. There's a, there's a young man right now that's leading a great movement uh for the lord in in uh, not far from us here and he was uh five years ago he was in prison he, he, was, a, he was a he was lost he was in prison and he is he's got a great and he's free from drug addiction he's leading a, it's a great movement of people that have been involved in a lot of addictions and they're just they're coming to know the lord they're sharing their testimonies you know you know, demons are being cast out and so forth. We have, for example, uh, another good friend that as a teenager, he was very, very rebellious. In fact, he fled to another state because the police were after him so much. Well, he came to know the Lord and then he became a police officer. Then he became a, 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 a standative and now he's a, a, state, rep a state senator just standing for Jesus mm -hmm. and in a powerful setting. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there, again, it's, it's not, we, we tend to think of just these conventional positions, jobs in an organized church body, but there's so much out there oh, that needs to be done. Yeah. That needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And God does not just call us to just serve inside a building. Mm -hmm. He's called us to, you know, the, the field is the world. Yeah. Jesus said, "Go into all the world." He said, "Did he said didn't he didn't say go into the church building mm -hmm. and preach the gospel?" He said, "Go into all the world. Mm -hmm. All the world means all the world." Mm -hmm. That so so God's sending you out there to be uh, to to be His His light and His salt. Well, in yeah, these days. and part of it is too that the mandate is the harvest to bring in the harvest. And when you're harvesting, there are many different jobs, positions, and things that need to be done to bring the grain from the field yeah you don't harvest by sitting around in your house yeah you go out into the field or you go out into the garden so this is where the men and women are to be going into the where the broken are the, the highways the hedges to compel them to come in and this is the work of god this is the greatness of god putting a, a mandate or a mantle or an anointing on someone to do something and here's the deal with the anointing we can't be anybody else. I can't be, you know, the next great author or the next great preacher or the next great guitar player. I can only be who God has called me to be and, and to recognize that anointing. So when you understand what God has anointed you to do, like he's anointing you guys to broadcast, to preach yeah. and teach with the technologies and interview skills and things, that's your anointing. That you like to do it. It's easy to do. It works. It works men especially are in find their anointing not where they're shoved into some little square peg in a round hole but where they actually fit in their job in their ministry in their um uh, in their calling they're happy and they're excited and they're motivated i think for us one of the problems with us was for a long time um in the beginning of our when we were young trying to figure out what we we're supposed to do with our lives and we had just gotten saved when we were in our 20s early 20s and we were just, I remember we were just pondering, well, what should we do? You know, you know, now that we're saved, what, what does God want us to do? Mm -hmm. And ultimately what we came up with was, 
that you were going to go into the ministry, you know, as, as we knew it at the time, pastoring, that was what we knew at the time. And the track that you followed to get into the ministry, obviously, was to go to a Bible school and get the, the education, the, the credentialing. That's the way it was back then, even though that's pretty unscriptural. Because, you know, Peter and James and those guys, they were unlearned men. They could write after a while, obviously. Um, but they didn't go to Bible school. And so, but we, that's the only thing we knew at the time. So again, you start out, you take a step of faith. You don't many times taking a step of faith. I remember us going to uh, the Bible school we went to and we were young and poor, very broke. We had three children and you had worked as a, a common laborer in a, in a lumber mill for many years, sawmill. And so when God said go, I think we went with a total of, um, what was it, 150 bucks? dollars uh, about 150 yeah and we had no we had we had to, would have to pay rent we had to pay a house payment we had no place to you know to, we had no books we had no money for tuition we god just said go and it was amazing how he met us in that step of faith and i remember leaving the bibles college after several years when we were graduated or jerry was graduated and i said well the only thing we really learned there was how to live by faith. <laughs> yeah, the, God proved his, his faithfulness. faithfulness. It's it's a matter of hearing from God. You, you have to hear from God and you step out. Mm -hmm. It says of Abraham, and uh, I think it's Hebrews 11, by faith he went out, he obeyed, not knowing where he was going. Right. God said, go. Other people said, Abraham probably thought, Abraham, you're crazy. What are you doing leaving your family? You're mm -hmm. going here to go and do this right. and that. But he'd heard from God, and and it, you know, when you hear from God and you take that step, even though if you you don't know what the outcome is going to be, you don't know exactly what's going to be involved, but you'll see, you mm -hmm. see the mm -hmm. Lord is faithful, faithful, and He comes through for you. And the other part of that is, you know, people around you will say you're crazy. What are you thinking? Why are you doing that? Because people want us to always stay safe and and do the traditional and stay with the the accepted route of everything. And I think being safe is a big buzzword, you know, because people are fearful and anxious and what's going to happen and you're going to not going to have enough money and, and all this stuff. But Jesus never said to be safe. He said, he who seeks to save his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will keep it. And I think for and going back to the word adventure, I think the adventure is following Christ. And to see that's real life. Now you're not playing, you're not pretending, you're not, you know, doing what other people want you to do. You're you're being true to yourself and following God. And um, and that becomes exciting. That is life right there. Mm -hmm.